right? So I happen to be uncharacteristic in real estate investing because I put large down payments down. I put down half, all right? And I'm going to get some people, oh, easy for you to say. It's like, you know, I've been around a long time, all right? When you're my age, you should have some money set aside. I love the idea of paying mortgages down, so I don't know what your equity profile is right now, meaning do you have 20% equity? If so, keep paying it down. Do you have 40? Maybe that's enough, all right? And then roll that income into buying more properties. I think a minimum number, I'd have to say that I'd be most comfortable that if you have 35% equity, or call it a third, so two out of three dollars in that property are debt, one out of three is equity, that I feel like is a minimum threshold. Push hard to get down to that level, and then if you're there, you can let the regular amortization of your mortgages kind of gradually bring it down from there, and then move the income over. Across the country, no matter where you go, there's an interplay between yield, the profit you make on the rents, as you know, and the appreciation rate. They kind of go together for because they're connected, right? So precisely because the property values haven't gone up, but the rents tend to go up because tenants outbid each other for a rental, because there's usually a little bit of a shortage of rentals, so the yield climbs, but the appreciation doesn't. And so in a lot of places in Cincinnati, for example, in Dayton, we see that market making its way to like a nine and a half to 10% ROI, and that's made up of like an 8% yield or a seven and a half percent yield and a 2% appreciation rate. If you go to where I live right. in Charlotte, it's like a six and a four. You go to Dallas, it's like a five and a five, right? It always seems to wind up ending at a 10 because of the interplay of price appreciation and yield. So we had a client, Paul, recently, who is a pretty sizable one, who's got like 100 million bucks, not a person, a fund, who wants to invest and they were asking, should we do what all the other big guys do and go to Atlanta and Dallas and Orlando and Nashville and Phoenix? And I said, well, maybe, but if you want to be next generation and think this through a little bit, you want to get yourself to a 10% ROI, but you could do Cincinnati and Austin, all right? And they said, huh, interesting, because Cincinnati is a low appreciation rate, high yield. Austin is a high appreciation rate, low yield. And so you kind of balance yourself out. You end up in the middle, but you're playing two different trends. You've got Bedrock Midwest and Cincinnati and you've got you know, a cool, hip, weird town down in, they call, they call themselves weird, in Austin, you know, the, the, the hipster city in the middle of Texas. So you're able to play two different mega trends. and like, we're, we're a national property management company, so we're able to help people do that where they can buy in two different places, have one point of contact for the management. Um, and so I, what I would encourage you to do is go to the research center, renderswarehouse.com slash research, and uh, play around with different markets and think about the idea of blending your portfolio. You've got some high yield, low appreciation. Maybe you look at DC or Raleigh or Charleston or Austin or Nashville where the yields are relatively low, but the appreciation is off the charts and kind of mix your portfolio that way. There are gems hiding in plain sight. So a couple of things. One, there can be some BS numbers on this. Right? When you see somebody advertising a building with a 9% cap rate, and then you go and you find out that they're not putting any maintenance in their numbers, that's gonna turn people off. Go get the numbers. All right, Make contact with the owner, visit the properties, get the numbers, uh, and see what's true and what's not true. And you may find, and it might be good news, you may find they're advertising a 12% cap rate, which is unheard of. So maybe you look for things that are actually above the cap rate that you require, uh, but they're not being, nobody's going after them because they're literally advertising to folks that want a 12 when it's really a nine. And so nobody who wants a nine is looking at it. There are deals hiding in plain sight on LoopNet. There are deals hiding in plain sight on Craigslist. And if it looks like uh, it's stale and too good to be true, realize that a whole lot of people are making that judgment, judging a book by its cover and maybe never did any work on it. Because it takes so much time to underwrite a building, you get any indicator that the seller is full of it and you just want to go find something else so you don't waste your time, okay? But time is the one thing that we can waste if we choose to. So if Jason's trying to find a deal, put the time in, all right? Put the time in to analyze those deals that look like they may be too good to be true. Like why would a great building in Jacksonville be sitting on LoopNet for 90 days? There's no reason. Don't assume Don't right. assume that it's because it's a, it's a, it's a bad deal. That's right. Think that there may be only 20% likelihood, but 20% likelihood that it's actually a gem that's being ignored because of where it is and how it's been presented. 
you can find winners that way. So Melody wants to know if I want to be an investor, does it help to get a real estate license to get access to the MLS? That way you can see what's coming on the market the morning it does before it shows up on Zillow. It's going to cost you a thousand bucks by the time you do the following. You have to join the MLS, but in order to join the MLS, in most cases, you have to join the, um, the Association of Realtors and you have to join the State Association of Realtors and you have to join the National Association of Realtors. So when you add all that stuff, it winds up being a thousand bucks. So there's a cost of doing business. There's also probably a 90 hour course that you have to take. Uh, if real estate's going to be your jam for the long term, it totally makes sense to do that because you get the inside track and of course if you are your own agent when you go buy a property well then there's a two to three percent commission that you're you can collect or just take off the uh, you know at the closing so you're able to pay your closing costs out of commission but to that point about the customer I would actually flip this one that the sm the, the large investors the large Wall Street clients could have taken a lot of knowledge from the small investors because a lot of small investors do that white glove thing. And I'm not sure it was any altruistic thing for the small investor. They were getting it right, many of them, because they met the people, they knew the people. We in this industry who own rental property are in competition with home ownership, meaning everybody wants to own a home, probably. At some point, they're gonna go and do that, probably, odds are. If we can hang on to them two or three years, if they stay five years because it's so damn good, like I make a phone call, stuff gets fixed. So the landlord's gotta write the checks, but I have this concierge service that I call my property manager or my owner and stuff gets fixed. If they stay an extra year or two, the economic impact on that investment goes through the roof. You can show up and start reading. Like one of the things that I love to do, here's a great example. All right, I'm looking at Google right here and I search city of Chattanooga, which is one of my favorite little towns that's coming on strong. Approves fiscal, fiscal year budget, business improvement district. You dig into these kind of things. I set up alerts on a whole bunch of different towns that I want to keep my eye on, and I do the Google alert, the name of the town, the city of blank, or the county of blank, or the town of blank approves. I did city of Belmont approves, train station showed up in my inbox. I knew the day that it happened, and I made the commitment shortly thereafter to start buying those properties. I wanted to wait until after it was approved, but before it was built. You know, I'm thinking about investing out of town. Is that a good idea? The answer is always pretty much the same. It's like, it is a good idea, maybe. How do you pick the town? I mean, if you live in California, like the person today does, you're not gonna find such great investments there. And if you wanna open yourself up, it's a big country. Um, it's, uh, it's a great idea, but start with like another market you're familiar with. Like that, not that many people like still live in the same town where they were born and haven't gone 10 miles away. Like usually there's something else. There's family elsewhere, there's experience elsewhere like college or whatever, right? It gives you some kind of anchor or maybe it's a place that you want to have an anchor. And so you say, I want to have Charleston, South Carolina in my life. And so I'm going to buy investment property in Charleston. So I have to go down there a few times a year and drive by it and then go get some dinner in the low country, right? Show up for a planning board meeting. Show up for an architectural review board meeting. Go check with the town, the municipality website. See when they have their meetings, when the person who wants to build 200 houses or a multifamily mm -hmm. complex and he has to get approvals for it, be in the room, <clears throat> right? There's 30 people in the room. You can see the gavel fall. You now saw something happen live. You can get a feel for whether or not the people who run the community are on board or not. It's research that you can do that only 30 other people are in the room doing it. Maybe mm -hmm. a couple of thousand read the article, maybe a couple of hundred read the article. Uh, but you're actually there watching it. You can have a conversation with the people who are driving it, figure out when they say, like, no, no, we have all the votes. Like, we only need five votes, we've got seven. This is all getting approved. That's the kind of thing where you're looking for a reason to run. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get a reason to run, you've got enough reasons to want to run towards it. That um, that's just that, that that's a great practice. 